to welcome you to, to this very important session uh, entitled Digital Dimension, No Access in a Digital World. So let's see if people can have access to this session easily and take part in the debates after the presentations that are to come. So I'm very pleased to welcome you to this uh, very special webinar in the series uh, that has been developed by the International Association of Universities under the title, The Future of Higher Education. Since uh, April, we've been looking at um, the immediate and the medium term and the long term impacts of COVID on higher education and also simply looking at the future of higher education in itself. So the webinar series that we've been conducting since has allowed us to go to many different aspects that have been impacted by the pandemic, but also those aspects of higher education that were under scrutiny and also discussed in terms of where it would go. So we looked at internationalization of higher education. We looked at the impact of COVID-19 on higher education, broadly speaking. We looked at the future of academic freedom or the future of value-based higher education. We looked at the strategic development of higher education, reopening strategies. And today we are in, um, in a next session specifically devoted to the digitalization of higher education. And what does that mean? Does it mean offering more access to many or is there still a huge issue of access? And so these are the, the broad ends of uh, entails of a, a very large question that uh, the speakers will have the opportunity to address uh, in their own uh, way. So I'm very pleased to give the floor to Trine Jensen, who is the manager of the work on technology at the International Association of Universities. Um, you will learn more about her activities as well if you go online and on the IU website, but she will also say a bit herself, but she's conducted a first global survey on digitalization of higher education that came out just prior to the pandemic and today is up for revision already and she may say a few words about that but also is carrying out a very important work on a statement on what it means to digitalize our higher education systems how should it be framed and to what end so it's just a, a little bit of information on um, the importance of the work that she's carrying out in the context of the International Association of Universities. So I give the floor to her. We'll get back towards the end to also possibly um, in part moderate the, the Q&A session. So I wish all, including myself, a very good session and a nice webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Hillage, uh, and good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening to the participants as well. And uh, thank you uh, to the panelists for being with us here for this session that we have decided to call the Digital Dimension, No Access in a Digital World. We have already had two webinars devoted to the digital dimension, but the first one we were looking at different modes of learning, be it uh, online learning, blended learning, and face-to-face -face, uh, learning. So we've looked at those uh, differences and the complementarity between them as well. We have had another session more looking at innovations that we could imagine post-pandemic, uh, in a post-pandemic wor world, hoping that we will get there sooner than later. And then, we have decided to devote this one specifically to the question of access and inequalities because it has not been debated in the previous sessions and it is a very important question that we must raise as well uh, at this time. Um, because the pandemic has of course shown that it has as well functioned as a magnifying glass to really demonstrate to what extent there are inequalities in terms of access to digital technologies and to the possibility of leveraging the opportunities that they offer. We saw that as well in the global IAU report on the impact on COVID-19 on higher education that it is uh, very different conditions that universities are facing in order to pivot and to offer all of a sudden remote uh, teaching and learning. So, um, and a, a, a final thing that I wanted to mention as well is that there is also a difference between having infrastructure and access to digital technologies at the university and then actually having access at home 
be it the faculty, the teaching staff, or the students, uh, etc. So there is a lot of questions in this world that we're currently living, where we are relying much more on digital uh, technologies that we used to just uh, at the beginning of the year. So the purpose of this session is really to discuss where does that leave us today? What are the lessons learned uh, that we that has from this disruption that has been triggered by the pandemic? And how do we move forward to, from here in order to try to bridge divides? So these are the questions that we put before you. And we are very pleased uh, to be able to discuss these questions along with the, the excellent panel that you, you see before you. Before I introduce our first uh, speaker, let me just explain as well, Hillich mentioned it as well, that we will go speaker by speaker. We will have a short presentation uh, from each of our three uh, speakers, and then we will have a Q&A session. So participants, you're very welcome to post comments, solutions, questions uh, in the chat, and we will try to incorporate those in the, in the debate that follows. So with no further ado, I will move to our first speaker. And it's true that on our screen, you see a photo of Stefania Giannini, who is the ADG of education and who was supposed to be with us today. Unfortunately, she was called to stand in for the director general of UNESCO in another meeting. And therefore, we are very pleased that she nominated Peter Wells, who is the chief of the, the section for higher education in the education sector at UNESCO. So we are very, very pleased to have, have him with us today to represent uh, UNESCO for this, uh, this panel discussion. Peter, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Trine and also Elish and distinguished participants. I'm just double checking that you can hear me because, or even see me, I'm not even sure, but uh, I can hear you very well. So can, can you all hear me okay? Me. So everything is fine. Okay, super. Well, thank you so much indeed. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, clearly I need to send uh, the regrets of Stefania, our ADG for education, who was very much looking forward to joining you in this session. Uh, but as uh, Trine just mentioned, unfortunately, uh, she was called away at the, the 11th hour. So I'm, I'm pleased to be able to uh, join the session and, uh, and to prevent, present some of the uh, UNESCO's perspectives and also those of um, uh, uh, Madame Giannini. Uh, I will try to keep this brief, but... Uh, Clearly, uh, the COVID pandemic has proven to be, for everybody in the higher education community, somewhat, I would say, of a wake-up call, especially for, for institutions in their efforts to speed up commitments to widening access via online learning and teaching, as well as for shift, the shifting modalities for collaborative research and how we go about that. But more than that, I suppose it as uh, the pandemic has disrupted every aspect of our lives, not least exposing the inequalities that have been for decades undermining our societies, whether they be across digital, gender, social, or of course, educational lines. Uh, recent statistics today show that over 225 million students have been affected in higher education. And many young people have had to either postpone their study, studies or have been forced to drop out and regrettably abandon their dreams of a university education due to the, uh, the pandemic. UNESCO has an Institute for Higher Education in Latin America, Latin America and the Caribbean, and their latest research estimates that one, one quarter of uni, university students in that region alone are left out due to lack of affordable access to technologies and platforms, and that only 75% of institutions have the capacity to offer online education. So hence, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has either resulted in complete closure, postponement of studies, hybrid studies, 
or online learning where that is even available. Similarly, we have a network of uh, UNESCO University chairs and new twin programs of more than 850 institutions globally. And when we surveyed them uh, back in April, we found that poor internet connect connectivity, social isolation, and of course, financial concerns were among the top challenges facing the learners that were even able to study remotely. For students and staff who can connect, concerns therefore are extrapolated into issues around the amount of screen time that teachers and learners have to be uh, on their black screens and also the, therefore the negative effects on mental health. This has uh, certainly uh, become an increasing issue. So the key question of this webinar is a very is a very relevant and important one for UNESCO and our member states. For example, should digital connectivity be part of human rights? In the same way as we have the universal right to education. And how can we ensure, therefore, that no country, no university, of which there are now 18 and a half thousand plus institutions recognized institutions around the world and no students are unjustly hit and left behind in the, the digital world we all live in. Uh, I would, uh, the UNESCO, uh, UNESCO for its part, beginning with the, uh, the, the beginning of the, the pandemic in beginning of March and actually to this day, launched the Global Co-Education Coalition, which was designed to renew global commitment to inclusion and quality in education, actually at all levels, not only higher education. Today, we are looking at over 160 diverse partners who we are working with in member states in helping to find solutions to ensure inclusion and equity of access at all levels. We are sharing innovations and lessons learned in providing virtual and blended learning solutions together with national policies for universal connectivity through a series of issue notes, webinars, and seminars and capacity building, because this is very much, uh, as uh, Hilly said in her introduction, it's all very well to have uh, where we can promote connectivity, but it's the use of that co connectivity which is the most important element that teachers at all levels and students at all levels uh, need to uh, to embrace and to learn. So we are learning to learn at the same time as we're learning to learn from our um, uh, discipline uh, areas. An example of that is uh, the UNESCO International Center for Innovation in Higher Education, uh, which is based in China, which is which launched Coincidentally, it's International Institute of Online Education back in December last year and is working specifically with higher education institutions in Africa to build digital capacities for higher education institutions, especially for education of teachers of countries in the region. Um, likewise, the UNITWIN program, the UNESCO Chairs program with the International Network on Sharing Knowledges and Experience of Distance Education, coordinated by the Korean National Open Universities, working with several universities in Asia to improve the quality of distance education. And I think this is one of the things that we really now, now need to focus on, is uh, the, the switch or the move to fully online, or let's hope hybrid online in the future, raises the questions now of how do we quality assure that uh, the, the provision of online higher education or hybrid education in the same way as we strive to quality assure through national mechanisms, national processes, quality assurance agencies for on campus. So online and on campus now become synonymous with quality assurance, issues of quality assurance. Um, 
As was mentioned before, we are, UNESCO is, of course, via SDG4, promoting universal access to information. Inclusive access to higher education demands equal attention is paid to people be, uh, we, uh, beyond the traditional learners. Now, one can argue that the, the traditional learner today is actually uh, possibly the non-traditional learner from previous times, whereas today we're talking about lifelong learners. We're also talking about uh, people with special needs. We're talking about people with need, special needs, with multi, with linguistic needs, learning difficulties, physical dis difficulties, within multicultural contexts. The World Health, Health Organization reported recently that around 15% of the world's population now have physical or learning disabilities. And disability is more prevalent in low and middle income countries than in higher, uh, higher income countries. So this is something that when we talk about equity of access, we need to also take this into account. Disabilities, gender, national, ethnicity, poverty, and many other factors affect access to the internet and the digital world. We know that online-based high-tech approach is not always ideal for creating an inclusive learning environment. So therefore, recognizing that students with disabilities, whatever those may be, or disadvantages, are facing greater barriers to access distance learning and rejoin classes using digital platforms. And UNESCO has recently published a collection of model education policies for inclusive ICT, which addresses this inclusive nature of the use of um, ICTs. When universities address policy questions on user-centered approaches, supporting teachers and professionals to use ICTs and the infrastructures they have, we can work towards equity of access to students, regardless of their social economic backgrounds, regardless of their learning or um, social difficult differences, and for all, therefore, reaching out to all students and university community members. And, uh, of course, addressing inclusion is a benefit for all communities that universities and higher education institutions serve. UNESCO is working with all the re world regions and countries with our partners in education and communication, as well as the business part partners. You may also be aware of uh, UNESCO's Futures of Education Commission which has called for a broadening of the right to education and to encompass a right to connectivity. We have launched the Lifelines Learning Initiative that aims to prepare the ground for, the groundwork for what we're calling Declaration on Connectivity for Education, which will call on member states themselves to lead the way in improving connectivity within their communities, particularly when it comes to uh, um, particularly when it comes to uh, education. Universities that have strong digital infrastructures, resources and, and digital skills and pedagogies are most likely to remain attractive and competitive within the global higher education sphere. Others are not only disadvantaged when it comes to domestic and international enrollments, teaching, assessment, and research activities. Hence, online presence also facilitates the management and the functioning of higher education institutions, including internal and external communication. Um, a final point, and I will wrap up because I can see my time is running out, but I think there really is, and I know that uh, uh, our ADG shares this view. The classical mindset of how we learn, how we teach in higher education is now at a turning point. The profiles of students in higher education are changing with more people taking up lifelong uh, learning opportunities at a diversity of higher education institutions. And just to recall, lifelong learning means exactly that. Higher education is no longer reserved for high school graduates. 
it is for individuals who may return to higher education throughout their professional lives or personal lives. It may be individuals who never went or undertook higher education learning earlier in life, but then need to retrain, reskill, upskill, requalify throughout their lives. And I think this is one of the things that uh, the higher education community really needs to acknowledge, address and embrace, because it's one of the areas that not only is it embodied in SDG 4.3, it is also part of the, the role that higher education institutions should be playing in the communities they serve. Uh, institutions also need to embrace the digital world and accept that the digital world is giving people more flexibility and choice in pursuing higher education outside of universities. And there's a challenge. Universities could well become redundant if they do not embrace the lifelong learning uh, demand of the societies that they serve. These changes coupled with the post-pandemic stage will require universities to upscale their efforts towards flexibility, resilience, adaptability and creativity to offer blended learning, blended learning that is of high quality and subject to community engagement. Let's be honest. Full time in class teaching is already a thing of the past. Blended learning is now the new norm. If we think about the learners, students do not learn how to learn in the digital world. How can they succeed in the world of life and work? Life and work in a digital age. With people attending multiple universities across the borders and completing their degrees and short courses, study programs, study abroad, exchange um, programs, this demands fair and transparent recognition mechanisms for these periods of studies or foreign qualifications or periods of study. And these were very clearly uh, laid down in the foundations of not only the regional conventions on the recognition of qualifications, but also on the global convention, which was adopted last, uh, last November, more or less this week, last year. And this has become ever more important. Um, just last week, our colleagues who are the Secretariat for the Tokyo Recognition Convention for the Asia Pacific region released a statement on the increasing importance of the recognition of learning qualifications and study periods taken remotely or in a blended approach. This is now crucial for the mobility of not only the mobility of students, but the international cooperation between universities. Similar initiatives and support mechanisms have been rolled out in other regions of the world, for example, in Europe and North America via the Lisbon Convention Bureau and the Enigmatic Networks. It's extremely important that all stakeholders of higher education, not least the networks, the higher education institutions, university associations, students, policymakers, employers, all take a collective and active role in acknowledging the value of and uh, the value of learning which takes place outside of traditional uh, uh, institutions, because that is going to be the future. And we must find a way for universities to be the hotspot or be the hub for creating that dimension and that innovation. Finally, uh, I apologize, I've spoken too long, but I would, uh, all of the discussions that will, uh, this webinar will, and the previous webinars for which I uh, can only uh, uh, applaud IIU for their excellent work on this, will, all of these webinars and discussions today will help 
uh, invigorate the third World Conference on Higher Education, which will be organized by UNESCO next October in Barcelona. Um, and we welcome all of your uh, uh, support and also your inputs to that conference as we look for to, to define and really hone what we would see as the new future of higher education. What do we want higher education to, to be? Who will it be for? How will we make that happen? Where will we make that happen? And why should we make that happen? So thank you very much. And I really look forward to the, the, the following speakers and the discussions. Thank you very much, uh, Trine, Chair. Thank you very much, Peter, for, for this uh, introduction and for sharing with you, uh, with us, your views on uh, the future of uh, education, because we are indeed in a moment of time where we have seen to what extent universities are kept, uh, have the capacity to innovate and to, to pivot and uh, to, to respond to, to emerging challenges in a very uh, short uh, time frame. So it will be very interesting to to see where this will lead us uh, in the in the future in a post pandemic world thank you as well for introducing many of the the different initiatives undertaken by unesco i think that's that's important because the 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 issue of uh, digital access is a difficult one and it's not one that can be solved mm -hmm. at the level of the universities, it is at the level of the member states and it's not of course within the mandate of UNESCO to solve the, the, the technical aspects of it, but it is indeed important that it is stressed as important on the, the global agenda. IAU is also very pleased to support UNESCO in many of the, these initiatives, the Global Coalition or the Futures Program. So we look forward to continuing this collaboration as we move along. And we definitely also look forward to receiving more information about the World Conference on Higher Education. But with no further ado, I will now move to our next speaker because we have set up this webinar with this global from UNESCO, but we also wanted to have uh, an on hands a feeling on how is it at, uh, on the ground in the universities. And we are very pleased to have with us today Paul Celesa, who is the Vice Chancellor of the United States University, uh, International University in Africa, in Kenya. Uh, Paul is also an administrative board uh, member of the IAU, so we are very pleased that he's supporting us not only in this webinar, but in the work of the association overall. Uh, Paul has served many universities, among others also in the US and in Canada, but we are very pleased to see him uh, representing the voice of Africa in this webinar, where he will uh, provide information about the, the context in this specific region and then of course also with examples from his local context in Kenya. So I will just move to Paul's presentation and then you have the floor, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Trin and Hiroji. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to share ideas about uh, the challenges that higher education is facing as a result of COVID-19, as well as the opportunities uh, for transformation. So my presentation is divided into six parts. I'll try to be very brief in each one. Uh, of course, the general impacts of COVID-19, uh, then the challenges that COVID-19 has posed for higher education institutions, uh, and thirdly, the opportunities as well. And then fourth, the retooling of African universities, uh, where I will share some ideas uh, from a number of forums that have uh, participated actively. And then uh, uh, talk about the Kenyan situation. And finally, uh, what are the demands uh, of this very, very uh, difficult moment for university leadership? So as we all know, you know, uh, COVID-19 has devastated healthcare systems, economies, employment, uh, as well as, of course, the welfare and well-being of populations around the world. Uh, it has posed challenges to governments, international intergovernmental agencies, and, of course, uh, educational institutions uh, over how to slow and stop the spread of the pandemic, mitigate the extensive and damaging effects of the pandemic uh, in the immediate and short term, and, of course, trying to protect the most vulnerable populations. And uh, certainly for institutions and organizations is to ensure survival 
and then of course uh, sustainability uh, after the pandemic. A tree. Um, for higher education institutions, I think what the, uh, the COVID-19 has done is of course to expose widespread differences and inequalities uh, with regards to national capacities to manage the crisis at its costs, institutional resources within and among countries, and of course the social class and spatial differences uh, in terms of IT access uh, that uh, we heard about and I'll speak a little bit more about. Uh, it has certainly revealed challenges uh, with regards to electronic infrastructures, uh, differences in institutional capabilities, to transition, for example, to online teaching and learning, issues of access by faculty and students to the appropriate uh, gadgets and of course to the internet, and then preparedness among faculty and students to use online platforms and resources. The Association of Commonwealth Universities did a survey uh, recently, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, which showed uh, some of the differences, for example, across Africa with reference to access to broadband by country. South Africa, 63% of access in Kenya, 54%, uh, Nigeria, 27%. And in the survey, uh, the challenges identified as more significant, uh, you know, dark, uh, the costs of data, 77%, uh, the issue of internet speed, 71%, identified that as a problem, and internet reliability, 65%. And then it also, uh, the survey demonstrated that before the pandemic, uh, only 16% of the African respondents reported having online, uh, you know, uh, programs in all or most of their courses. Uh, and then after COVID-19, 74% have moved online. Of course, there are national differences, South Africa, 94%, Kenya, 62%, and Nigeria, 22%. Uh, and, and the COVID has also, of course, uh, shown deficiencies in universities' instructional uh, delivery capabilities in, in terms of institutional capacities to offer uh, instruction remotely using online platforms, which is not the same as online education. Uh, what we've been doing is offering online, uh, using online platforms. Uh, uh, and of course, so what is needed is also to develop online degree programs and other programs. Uh, and there is, of course, faculty distrust and discomfort with online teaching com uh, and learning compared to face-to-face. -to -face. And students, parents, and employers uh, have, of course, concerns about the quality of online instructions. And then uh, fourth, it has under uh, undermined internationalization of higher education. It has exposed uh, you know, the patterns of international student flows uh, that have either you know, uh, slowed down uh, or come to a standstill and expose their unevenness and unequalness in terms of transnational flows of students uh, and faculty. For example, most students leave Africa to study elsewhere. Uh, they constitute more than 10% of international students, but only 4%, a little over 4% of uh, students from elsewhere study on the continent. And it has raised questions about international and inter-institutional academic collaborations. It has also raised questions about the research role of universities, specifically with regards to the capacity of, uh, for uh, biomedical research for preventive and curative treatments, research on the social, economic, political, and environmental impacts of the pandemic, and of course, the provision of research-based and data-driven policy advice and interventions. Uh, and uh, finally, it has aggravated financial stress for universities. There is no university that I know of that is not facing financial challenges, uh, you know, as a result of the recession or slow economic growth for many national economies. And all major five sources of university finances are under stress. Government subventions, tuition fees, institutional income generation activities, donations and loans. And then of course, declines in domestic and international student enrollment and ability uh, to pay tuition. Uh, this of course uh, has uh, impacted different investors in different ways. There are, of course, also opportunities for higher education uh, that COVID has thrown up, uh, at least opportunities for us to begin rethinking, uh, you know, how we do our business. So one is uh, the question of institutional preparedness. Uh, I think it is enhancing institutional business continuity planning and disaster preparedness. Many of us were concerned, for example, in East Africa or Kenya uh, with natural disasters and, of course, terrorism and so on. But we begin to realize that uh, uh, issues like health pandemics can also be a major issue 
that can catch you by surprise and you need to be prepared for it. Uh, mobilizing and preparing stakeholders through concert, consultation and communication is a challenge for all of us internally within our own institutions and of course with external stakeholders. Enhancing institutional capacities for resilience, flexibility, access and inclusion. And then it has also of course provided opportunities to strengthen institutional investments in IT infrastructure. It is accelerating the digitalization of university functions and operations outside teaching and learning. And uh, a lot of institutions now are embracing the fourth industrial revolution and its implications for future, the future of jobs and lifelong learning. Uh, and then now, of course, it's also uh, forcing us uh, obviously to develop new modes of teaching and learning, uh, the development of multiple teaching models, the, as uh, the previous speaker, Peter, uh, indicated uh, universities will not go back to the past. They will involve multiple modalities of teaching and learning, face-to-face, -face, online, and blended, that offer opportunities for time shifting and space shifting flexibility and opening a new, um, you know, sort of uh, access for different uh, demographics of students. And it's also facilitating changes for faculty as facilitators for active and lifelong learning. Uh, the old days of the uh, faculty member being the uh, sage on the stage are frankly gone. Uh, now it's much more facilitation, it's much more coaching, it's much more co-learning. The other opportunities also involve uh, trend. Uh, the issue of developing collaborations. I think it's generating new thinking about effective inter-institutional collaborations, uh, creating greater need for investors to work with external stakeholders for impact. And then of course, reinforcing the need for leveraging external support for financial sustainability. All of us in universities are thinking about these issues. And of course, re-envisioning internationalization. This is a great opportunity to begin thinking about new modalities for international study, research, and collaboration. And of course, they need to prioritize online collaborations and online skills uh, development. And of course, the whole question of managing finances and mitigating inequalities. They need to develop much more sophisticated uh, business intelligence tools for, the, uh, for data-driven decision-making, developing more effective financial models for student aid and support, and prudence in budget uh, planning and management and monitoring and evaluation uh, is, is becoming an issue we all have to face to. Uh, and then leveraging government philanthropic private sector support for needed students. And uh, of course, universities re-examining their enrollment management systems and student pipelines, especially as online education and blended education uh, develops. I'd like to share very briefly with you some of the takeaways from a number of forums, specifically the Alliance for African Partnership, um, uh, which uh, brings together Michigan State University and about 10 African universities. Uh, I happen to be on the board of, of the AAP and I moderated a series uh, of webinars uh, uh, between April and July, there were six of them. And we looked at a number of areas, I'm not going to of course details. One was uh, how are African uh, universities responding uh, to the pandemic and what lessons are they learning? Uh, some of the universities uh, transitioned to emergency online teaching and learning and provided health services in their medical schools. Several made innovations and produced uh, hygiene products and personal protective equipment such as hand sanitizers, masks, ventilators, epitents for patient isolation and mobile hospitals, testing kits and robots for delivery of food and medicines to, uh, to patients. Many undertook research on the epidemiology of the coronavirus and biomedical treatments and the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic, and of course, providing uh, advisory services uh, to government. And very fascinating development of software to monitor the pandemic's spread and sought to raise awareness and provide psychosocial support uh, to their constituents and the wider society. Also, it's become very clear that the pandemic among African universities is leading to new forms of partnership and collaboration, uh, both North-South, South-South, uh, and of course, intra-regional. Uh, and of course, uh, many of our universities paying attention to um, not only uh, you know, the continents, but also some of the world's pressing challenges, uh, including income equality, youth employment, climate change, food security, and migration, and how all these are impacting uh, higher education. Uh, it also boasted 
uh, also being posted is the development of a complex web of global, continental, and regional partnerships, multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral teams and pro, uh, problem-based uh, 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 approaches. And new inter-institutional partnerships are also growing, including joint research, sharing of online curricula and ICT facilities, faculty and student digital skills training, and the development of dual degree programs. So a lot of exciting things are actually happening uh, with regards to that. And then of course, on the issue of educational access, uh, this is uh, something that Peter also mentioned, at the height of the pandemic during the summer, 1.6 billion children and youth stayed at home and the transition to uh, online delivery has exposed striking digital and financial divides among institutions and students, as I said earlier. And uh, ensuring continuity uh, has involved, of course, uh, trying to strengthen the structures, systems, and resources to support online uh, learning, planning for the recovery phase, and repurposing education for the future. Uh, this requires developing very clear social justice principles of accessibility, inclusivity, flexibility, equitability, and connectivity. It is crucial that no student or institution is left behind. And of course, the pandemic has uh, thrown up a lot of challenges uh, with regards to economic food security and livelihood impacts, uh, disruptions of food production and uh, supply value chains. And then of course, universities have been very involved, African universities, uh, in mitigation measures, including undertaking research projects, training programs and community activities to improve food security and safety, crop diversification, poverty alleviation, women's empowerment, youth entrepreneurship, and the investment in retail markets. Also, the, you know, which uh, has been very critical, uh, and a lot of universities are doing this, uh, is the production of data, modeling and mapping of the spread and impact of the pandemic for more effective public policy responses to build more resilient economic food and employment systems. And then the other area that uh, African universities are also making very interesting uh, developments uh, is, is over mental health. They, you know, we all know that uh, you know, the pandemic is uh, exacerbating mental health issues for students and employees. Um, and and uh, you know, that was a problem before, but it's becoming worse. Uh, universities have responded obviously by strengthening counseling services, providing uh, teletherapy and wellness coaching, and you know, even establishing new courses uh, and programs to deal with these issues. For the wider society, they're also trying to intervene and provide services uh, to deal with mental health issues. And then of course, finally, is the area of partnership and engagement. Uh, the you know, the um, uh, crisis has led to interventions that have uh, you know, centered on strengthening institution, uh, institutional capacities, promoting productive partnerships, and providing resources for relief, recovery, and resilience. A lot of universities are working together in this area. Um, and of course, also working together with regards to faculty development and training, research capacity on pressing issues and on higher education and technological infrastructure and online instruction. And also you find uh, very interesting uh, partnerships and, and uh, collaborations with regards to uh, financing and diaspora linkages and, and so on and so forth. So um, a lot of uh, very exciting work uh, is happening uh, despite of course the magnitude uh, of the crisis, which is debilitating many of these institutions. So in conclusion, uh, with regards to what African universities are doing, many uh, have transitioned to online teaching and learning. They've embarked on much needed research and are producing innovations. They've strengthened partnerships among each other and with other national, regional, and global actors. They have contributed to the development of transformative economic and social policies and interventions, and they have begun to rethink the future of higher education. There is hardly a week uh, when there is not a major conference on what the uh, pandemic means for higher education. I happen to be involved in a lot of those. Let me now go to the Kenyan scene uh, and simply underscore the role of a major Kenyan organization called Kenet, Kenya Education Network, uh, which uh, you know uh, connects all the uh, countries, universities uh, in terms of uh, um, ICT infrastructure. Um, uh, I happen to be the chair of the Board of Trustees of Kenet. Um, it was established in 2000 by five universities, the Republic, University of Nairobi, Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, and Moy University, and two private ones, Daystar and uh, USIU, 
uh, were of course sublocated. The objective was to provide affordable high-speed uh, broadband internet to support teaching, learning, and research and administrative efficiency among higher educational institutions and research networks in the country. Uh, the, it has, uh, uh, you know, uh, over the last 20 years, uh, really registered huge achievements. Uh, it, it has connected the Kenyan research and education community domestically and globally through UbuntuNet and uh, GEANT in Europe. So the Kenyan research community, educational community, can access and uh, uh, you know, uh, engage with researchers around the world uh, through these networks. Since COVID broke out, uh, we in Kenet uh, decided to undertake a number of significant interventions in the Kenyan higher education space and research uh, space. One was we provided uh, faculty training for online teaching and cyber security. Uh, more than two to 3,000 faculty across the country were trained. We conducted separate monthly webinars for vice chancellors and ICT directors. Vice chancellors are critical because you want to make sure that the investor leadership is behind the changes that need to be made in terms of uh, uh, ICT infrastructure. Uh, provided, uh, you know, developed uh, our own learning management system and helped universities upgrade uh, their own systems and uh, reduced connectivity fees and negotiated discount data bundles for hundreds of thousands of students and faculty across Kenya and established working groups on student lap uh, lap laptop ownership, remote exam proctoring, virtual labs for STEM courses, integrated Kenneth remote teaching platform with YouTube and Facebook for live streaming uh, uh, of large uh, classes. Let me conclude uh, by uh, underscoring what, um, the need that the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, is, uh, uh, you know, forcing uh, leaderships in university uh, institutions to become more, um, you know, um, to develop uh, better skills. And the leadership, I mean, from the board of trustees, investor councils, management, vice chancellors, to department chairs. So there are 10 key skills that need to be sharpened. One is financial acuity. In addition to managing budgets, which we are all used to, is the ability to manage reductions in staffing, programs, and space. Secondly, cultural competence, exhibiting deep awareness of systemic injustice, inequality, and privilege, and how you mitigate against that. Technological deftness, exhibiting, modeling, and promoting institutional technological savviness and competence, and developing analytics uh, expertise to promote data-driven decision-making. And of course, crisis management, managing uh, a physical and mental health crisis, emergency preparedness and business continuity, and leading in times of uncertainty. None of us ever could have predict, uh, predicted uh, at this time last year that the world would be brought to a standstill by COVID-19. But here it is, and we have to manage it. And then, of course, developing entrepreneurial mindset, being calculated risk takers, innovative entrepreneurs in promoting the investment mission with external partners. And then the other uh, final set of skills that we all need to sharpen is political savviness, ability to work in uncertain and politically polarized times and promote institutional discourse that is calm, informed, and respectful. Uh, sharpening our empathy and respect, demonstrating empathy and respect for all um, you know, uh, our internal constituencies, and even revealing our humanity in decision making multi genre communication skills. We are increasingly expected to provide efficient, timely, clear, and persuasive messages and stories to diverse constituents, uh, constituencies using multiple platforms. And of course, we all need to enhance our emotional intelligence, de demonstrating self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, and social skills, not being egotistic, impulsive, and prone to bullying and micromanagement. And of course, agility ability to be flexible in the face of many changes, capacity to learn and assume new and more responsibilities and show fortitude and flappability and moral compass. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for this uh, a very interesting presentation, pro providing a broader 
perspective on some of the challenges uh, encountered in Africa uh, within the, the, the context of pandemic but also showing many of the opportunities that, that you can draw on and uh, use in order to, to build as we move forward. Um, I think that it was very interesting to see how you collaborated as well within Kenya and pulled the resources together in order to, to tackle some of the challenges and to build uh, capacities. I find that interesting. And then finally, thank you for summer, summing up uh, the long list of skills that is required for the leadership to actually to cope and to manage uh, and steer through this crisis that we are all going through. I think that's uh, very important because it really shows to what extent that um, universities are asked to change and adapt to completely uh, unimagined uh, situation. Um, so thank you very much, Paul. We will now turn to our third speaker. And I'm very pleased as well to introduce uh, Claudio Rama, who is academic director at the Universidad de la Empresa in Uruguay. He's based in Montevideo. But he's more than that. He's also a researcher, a consultant, and an expert in higher education. and. Um, um, most particularly in the area of online and virtual learning. Uh, he has also headed uh, the uh, Institute of ISALC, the UNESCO Institute um, in, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, so we are very, we're looking very much forward to, in the same manner, understanding a little bit the question of equality, inequalities in the Latin America and the Caribbean. Claudio, you have the floor, please. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to stay a discussion of the digital dimension of our future in Latin America, in the area of higher education, in the context of the pandemic. It's a, a big pleasure to, to be here. Well, the, the, the first that I would like to, to talk is about a, that we are in a digital revolution. So we need to analyze all the aspect that happens in the context of the pandemia, in the situation that all the world is changing and we are in a new phase of the process of our world in the beginning of a digital revolution. This happens for the 70th of the last century and uh, the, this scenario is the mark of we need to analyze the world developing through technological phases and this phase have been going on long before the first industrial revolution so uh, now we are in a disruptive technical innovation that change all the form of production distribution and consumers and also shape social structure these digital cycles that began in the last century that was increasing reconfigure the demands of education obviously the offers in the pedagogies the actors the interfaces the learning research the quality levels and also the form of management and the coverage levels of higher education and all the sector of education in this scenario, we are um, in the last uh, decades advancing in this situation of all the countries are changing this structure, are changing this business, are changing these forms of work, and also they're changing these systems of education. The labor markets are transforming. In this scenario, always the educations are changing in to respond to the new uh, technological economic change. <clears throat> uh, these dynamics that we are analyzing in all the worlds obviously depends of the countries, depend of the economics, but they have an expression in the transformation of the university system. We can analyze that in the university sector, we have four 
definition, we have four phases. Obviously, the, the face to face university that we call 1.0 university before the book. Second, the university 2.0 that we talk, the educational factory that are started and serialized from one to many supported with the books. The third phases of the education of university is that we are analyzed the analogical university or 3.0. The radio, the TV, the printing and the electricity created this kind of university. And <clears throat> the distance education was created with this scenario. Obviously, not only books, videos, cassettes. Now we are in a context that all the universities are in the process of transformation. That's someone that we call the University 4.0, <coughs> the network digital university. Could be synchronicus, could be asynchronicus, could be hybrid, could be global, but all of these universities are changing to use the digital uh, uh, technological to help the process of uh, education, to help the uh, research, to help the management of the institution. So all the university, more than less, are changing and this dynamical to transform, to be more efficient to use the technology. And it's not only in the institutional university, all the organizations are changing in a new global economic digitization, uh, economic uh, uh, digital. But in this situation, the drivers are obviously the computer, microelectronic, and information company. What is happening is that in this process of transformation, not all the countries and not all the continents are uh, transforming in the same dimension. In America, we try to analyze it integrated into the value of the world, not with the digital infrastructure but also with the traditional commodities company in the industrial side. When we analyze the 30 companies in Latin America, only one is in the communication sector. 13 are in oil, 6 in food, 4 in retail, 3 in steel, 2 in cement, and 1 in electric. So what the first problem that we have is that the transformation of Latin America in the digital world is not at the same level in the rest of the continents. When we analyze the participation of the telecommunication sector in the GDP, in Latin America is only 2%. But when we analyze the countries of OECD, it's 0.44%. Uh, so our problem in Latin America is that the economy and the society is not changing. The enterprises are not changing. And also the market labor is not changing in the dynamic that we need to be part of a digital world. Obviously, <clears throat> we are in the process of trans trans transition, transition. So we, if you, we analyze the situation of the telecommunications uh, sector, relatively, we have a important development in Latin America. The internet uses uh, in 218 is more than 437 million 
we have a penetration rate, is the percent of the population that use internet, of 67, it's, uh, important, the lines of cellular is have a penetration of 71 percent also the penetration of broadband connection reached at the 68 percent of the population and also if we analyze only two percent of the average monthly income is required to contract a fixed broadband service of one Mbps. Also, the number of households connected to internet in the region is 43% of the total in 250. So we have a very relative uh, good, good position in the participation of the people in the internet world, in the connected possibility to use a high education as virtual to access. But what, what we happen is that the regular framework of the legality of 100% of virtual education in our country is not a ability to all the countries. What that means is that in few countries, we don't have the possibility to use the distant education in 100% of the possibility. <clears throat> Brazil and Argentina, only in the last year, they permit to offer in virtual education completely. And the most part of Latin America country, Recently, that they habilitate, they permit to offer in virtual education. So we have a continent that is not a, a participation in the global economy as a digital participation. We have relative good uh, capacity of internet and computers, but we don't have the legalization completely to offer in a virtual education. That's determined that we have a low percentage of distant education in the total enrollment of high education. <clears throat> the country that have a more important percent of distant education in the enrollment of higher education is Brazil that have 22%. But the most part of Latin America, they have restrict. So the average is 14%. Some country as Argentina is less than 5% the percentage of distant education in the total enrollment of higher education. Chile, 2%. Colombia is 17%. Honduras is 14%. Mexico, 12%. So the most part of the country, they don't have, before the pandemic, a important participation of virtual education. The graduates, when we analyze the graduates from distant education in the total of graduate students in high education, uh, Brazil is the bigger. They have 20% of the graduates are from distant education. Colombia is 16, Mexico 15, Dominicana 12, Argentina 7, Chile 3. Uruguay zero. So we have limitations to distant education. So the capacity of the system to transform, to use internet is very limited. This, in the last day, years, this was increasing. When we compare 210 to 
the situation before the pandemic, all the country was increasing the evolution of the incidence of high education in the new student. But the continent is half of the percentage of high education in distant education in the developed country. So the situation, so we cannot synthesize in that uh, the distant education is, is growing, growing fuller uh, in the enrollment, but it's a little coverage. The coverage of Latin America is 52%, uh, but the coverage of distant education is less than 50%. And that is very differentiation by country. The country that have more importance in distant education or virtual education is Brazil, on where 20% of the graduate students comes from virtual education. And also, we have a very, very concentration in a very few institutions uh, that have a very big level of investment this concentration are no more than 20 institutions in all Latin America that have the most part of the distant education. So we have not only a very little participation of virtual education, but also this participation was reduced to a very few quantity of institutions. So the rest of the university, more than 2,000 uh, of university, practically they don't have virtual education. Uh, <clears throat> These institutions that have the, the participation in higher education, most of them or part of them have a presence of global groups, international global groups. <clears throat> and also, this is with high level of absorption of subcontracting service in distant education. This is the situation of the <clears throat> uh, high education and digital uh, situation when the pandemic arrived to our continent. And the transformation of the a situation with the pandemic was very, very quickly and were very, very big. So practically 10% of the classes, of the classrooms of high education are transforming to a synchronously system. Not always with LMS support, but this activity was totally monopolized by Zoom Google Meet or Microsoft uh, team. <clears throat> so it's with this kind of enterprises that Latin America in the higher, higher education sector practically he uh, transformed the presential education to a new uh, virtual or synchronous education. <clears throat> but uh, the participation of this uh, presential education uh, was very reduced because the practical activities have not been resolved for everyone yet by your technology. So what we have is a model of education that have more theoretical, more academical, more a information and not for created competence. This new hybrid uh, model of higher education is being built, but the, the pandemic revealed also the weaknesses of access in the digital contents due to the lack of infrastructure and equipment in homes. But the situation in Latin America is that the participation of the most poor families in higher education is very limited. The 
contribution of the coverage is 50%. And this 50% is the families that have more economic good situation. So these kind of students that don't have equipment and infrastructure to participate in the new hybrid model of higher education, most part of them don't study at the higher education because they don't finish secondary or they are not introducing in a higher education. So this is the, the situation that we can to analyze in the uh, reality of Latin America. First is that uh, the evolution to a distant uh, digital society is less and the most part of the economics the dynamics are not uh, in the digital economy, but continues to be in the analogical economy. Second is that the internet access are relatively good in the cities, but the, we have limitation to traditionally use distant education. We have a very little quantity of studies in distant education, and this also is limited in some country more than others. And the last point is that the uh, pandemia transformed very, very quickly the presential education to face-to-face -to, -face to a virtually distant education, and this was reduced to a quantity of a student of the sector of that have more economics good situation of the families because the participation of the poor student of the poor family in the higher education in Latin America is very reduced. I'm exception of maybe Chile or maybe Argentina, the most part of the students of the uh, less income sectors and family don't access to higher education before and also they don't access now. Well, thank you very much. I'm in at what your disposition. Thank you very much, uh, Claudio, for, for your presentation and for bringing this uh, overview of the, the developments in Latin America and also explaining to what extent that there is reluctance as well at the at the, the system level in terms of integrating the, the potential of uh, digital uh, technologies even before the pandemic. And then, of course, that creates a, a context where you are less equipped to pivot to this uh, new mode of, of, uh, of teaching and learning that we are seeing in many places due to the, the pandemic. So thank you to all of the speakers. We still have some time uh, for discussion. So I think that uh, we will start here. And I would actually like to start with you, Claudio, and I have a, a, question, a question for you. Do you think now that the mindset is going to change um, following the pandemic and this period where, that have, where we have come to rely much more on digital technologies? Or do you think that it is a, a temporary phase and then in the post-pandemic world, we will go back to a way before? Or will there be done more in order to enhance uh, not only the digital infrastructures, allowing more equal access, but also uh, um, change the mindset in terms of how can we actually use digital technologies for good in higher education, for quality higher education? We, we don't have a get back uh, because the reality changed completely. Uh, most of the factories close. Uh, the people that lose the jobs are very, very important. And the uh, um, what we call the teletrabajo, to the, the work uh, used uh, networks uh, are completely developed in the last year. So uh, it's impossible to get back. But in the same times, 
the higher education transform completely. For teachers, it's maybe better to use this new technology. Uh, also, for students, it's better sometimes because they don't have to move. Cities in Latin America, as all the world, are very, very complicated to move inside. The institution in Latin America, there are localized in some part of the capitals of the city that are very complicated to arrive now because they are in the centers. So uh, I don't think that we are going to get back because everything is changed. And all the families and the university put a lot of money. They make a very big ring areas to introduce new uh, equipment. Uh, they put off a lot of people that form extractive jobs and they contract uh, new people that technological works. And also, um, I think that the governments are very, very open to change the regulation that in the past were very, very uh, rigid. So in this moment, also the, the copyright is increasing. You are not reducing the coverage, is increasing. And we have more people that are accessed with virtual education than in present education. Uh, and also we have more demands of postgraduate students than in the past. So uh, when the market decreased, when the labor market decreased, the people try to increase the human capital. And that is something that happened now. A difference, when the economy grow, the people uh, uh, desert, uh, they draw up of their education. So this situation for me is going to change completely the future. And we are going to have a new combination of a uh, synchronous education, uh, asynchronic education with LMS, and a little part of presential education in laboratories, and obviously some exam and evaluation. But the combination that we used uh, in the past are not the same that we're going in the, in the future. And also the people have the people, the, the, the teacher, have a new a level of competition that they don't have before. In a very few times, the institution transform completely. The problem is not in high education. The problem is in secondary and in primary education, because in these areas, the distant education, the virtual education, they are not introducing as it happened in, in, in high education. But uh, we don't have to get back to any situation in the economy, in the education, and also in the political situation. Yeah. So the pandemic is uh, pushing this digital transformation forward uh, in, in higher education. Um, Paul, let me turn to you as well, because Africa is another continent where we do not necessarily have full internet uh, uh, penetration. And you also underlined in one of your slides that uh, in the survey conducted by uh, ACU that uh, data and the, the, the cost of data is very high. So that is also an obstacle for, for students and for the families and as well as for, for, for staff. Do you think that um, due to the pandemic that more is going to be done to enhance the infrastructure uh, compared to if we, we did not have this pandemic or has it become a, a priority or how, how do you see, see the future um, in Africa? Yes, I, I do think that the pandemic is accelerating uh, investments uh, and interest in uh, uh, improving the um, infrastructure for ICT. And this is, of course, uh, coming at uh, multiple levels uh, in terms of government's awareness to do this, um, and certainly for the private sector, uh, as well as, of course, for international and intergovernmental agencies. Uh, the African Development Bank, for example, 
uh, is is investing quite heavily uh, in, um, in you know helping countries and institutions uh, to strengthen their ICT infrastructure. The issue of availability of data, uh, access to data, uh, that uh, one of the uh, commentators uh, was asking, uh, I think this one is still up in the air uh, in terms of the provision uh, of this data at either very low cost or at no cost at all for educational institutions. I think this is something that uh, we all have to continue fighting for uh, because it, it becomes, I think, increasingly, uh, Peter raised the question early on, uh, you know, uh, the issue of uh, ICT, access to ICT as a human right. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly ICT as a gateway uh, towards education. Uh, in that context, I think it does make sense uh, to begin having very serious conversations and interventions in the provision for uh, educational institutions of data. People, of course, have been talking about the provision of uh, tablets, uh, provision of computers for primary, secondary, and so on. And this has been talked about you know, for quite some time. And the Kenyan government had a program to do that. So I think the next frontier in this debate is access to data, uh, provision of data at either very, very low cost, which is happening in some cases, uh, or at no cost at all, in order to uh, uh, provide uh, um, you know, educational uh, access for uh, students and affordability. So this is, I think, the new frontier in the debate about educational rights. Thank you very much, Paul. And I think that we saw an example of that as well in one of our uh, previous uh, webinars as well, where one of the universities had been negotiating data packages at a very, very low cost with some of the private sector for the university to actually offer uh, data to the students. But maybe, Peter, that is a, a question back to you uh, in terms of access to data, because I, that was also, uh, I'm very pleased that you, you mentioned this idea of connectivity as a, a human right, because education, the right to education uh, exists. But uh, today in the world that we are living, uh, we more or less require digital access in order to access information, to in order to access knowledge, in order to have uh, and participate in different types of exchanges, uh, whether it's nationally or internationally uh, or regionally. So, so this idea of, of access uh, to data and to connectivity as a human right mm. is something that is on the agenda of, of UNESCO and, and how, I, how are you moving forward there? Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for giving me like two minutes to respond to that. But also before I do so, I would like to uh, applaud the uh, presentations from Claudio and also from Paul. I think you've, you know, you're talking about some very real, realistic issues from your your regions, from the Africa region and from Latin America and Caribbean. And we are very much, UNESCO is very cognizant of this. And I should say that, you know, each region of the world has its own difficulties. We are, we may be all in a pandemic, but we are all facing the challenges in very different ways. We're also change, uh, facing uh, the challenges of online te teaching and learning or blended learning at all levels, primary, secondary, tertiary, in very different ways and very different contexts. So I, I do think we should keep in mind that there cannot be one size fits all. I mentioned in my introductory remark, remarks about the Declaration on Connectivity, the UNESCO is uh, pioneering, but which will be led by member states because it's ultimately down to the member states to be able to commit to that and to increase the ac access that learners or even the general population at large for data and access to information, whether they be enrolled in formal learning, informal learning or non-formal learning. It's extremely important that they have that access. One thing that I would, uh, listening to the uh, my esteemed colleagues' presentations, one thing 
that does strike me, particularly when we focus on higher education. We, everybody is spoken about the changing mindset. And I think that mindset is very much connected to the issue of confidence and trust in any form of education delivered online at any level, primary, secondary, tertiary. And <clears throat> I, in many ways, and this, I can certainly speak for all regions of the world, not just Latin America, the Caribbean, not just Africa, not just Europe and North America or Asia Pacific, etc. What we see is that we have a lack of confidence by teachers in the quality of online versus on campus or on school provision. We have lack of confidence in parents in the differences between on campus, on online and on school provision. We have lack of confidence with employers in the differences between online, on campus, on school. And this is the major challenge we face now, that ultimately the stakeholders, the students, the parents, the employers, but also the providers themselves, which are the teachers, the professors, the institutions, they still seem to be, and there seems to be an underlying current that, that on, anything online is inferior to anything on campus. And until we can breach that bridge, till we can convince ourselves in the higher education community and our stakeholders that it's as good to learn remotely as it is to, re to learn directly, then we cannot move forward. So I think the higher education community of institutions has made an enormous leap forward. Maybe, maybe the pandemic has, if one positive could come out of this, for the higher education community is that there is a can-do spirit now, that we can do things that we didn't think we could do before. But still, the underlying, not tension, but the underlying suspicion is that we are not providing as good a quality online or remotely as we were when we were face-to-face or on campus, and I think that is the big change we we we, fo we need to face now. Um, so thank you very much, Trine, and thank you so much for uh, uh, my colleagues uh, with their pres for their presentations. And I'm seeing some nice uh, comments in the chat. So thank you. Back to you, Trine. Thank you. thank you, thank you, Peter. And I see that the time is is up. Uh, when we have good uh, conversations and interesting mm -hmm. information, then time passes very fast. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give back the floor to to Hilich uh, to to close this session. Yeah, well, um, I will just <laughs> be in visible just for one minute to thank you for the excellent presentations and also for triggering a lot more. Uh, reflection points for uh, future debate because that is actually what you did. We only uh, had the opportunity to uh, to listen to these excellent points but not to debate much further uh, and that's a pity because there are so many points in what you said um, Paul or Claudio or Peter that, um, that require further uh, reflection also in the future so we will um, definitely reflect on those and see what we can take to a next session uh, also on the topic of the digitalization of higher education. And we may come back to you for uh, questions or exchange in the future as well uh, on the, the various points that you've made. So it's a little bit easier with you, Paul, because we may share your PowerPoint presentation if you agree. Um, but as well, I'm sure, Claudio Rama, you have written about these topics or, or you will. And if you have, so please do share a few links that would be uh, interesting for people to read again and they will have the opportunity to listen to the presentation again because the recordings will be made available and the same for you Peter because the 
uh, it was very rich in terms of all the various aspects that um, were touched on uh, from um, the, the students, the access to technical parts, but also the very challenges to the leadership, uh, those, uh, those slides on, on the, the challenges and opportunities for leadership to transform today. Um, the requests um, on uh, the part of, uh, of the higher education uh, institutions to transform, to react, to offer different forms of, of education. Um, and it will be interesting to see in, um, in, in next debates as well how this impacts the kind of content that is being provided, um, uh, not only to whom, but what, uh, and, and how the digital transformation will possibly allow to better connect knowledge systems around the world and to also see um, what kind of knowledge is being shared, because that is also a very important part that was alluded to by all three of you in different forms and shapes. So it's um, it's uh, it's only at the end of, of those presentations that we just hope that we have an extra hour. We don't. Uh, we thank you very much for your excellent presentations and for all those in the chat for uh, coming from so many different parts of the world as well. We know that the videos are used afterwards as well in different contexts. And if uh, questions come our way, we will share them with the uh, with the speakers again uh, next as well. So I would like to thank you all for your participation and look forward to continued cooperation in different forms and shapes in the future as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.